All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Rays Reflection Podcast. Um, I'm going to have to skip the introduction because my next guest has a very short window of time, and I want to be respectful of that. So without further ado, he's a contestant on the upcoming season of The Voice. Uh, he's a talented musician, and he's a soon-to-be husband. Uh, thank you for coming on, Jay Allen. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Nathaniel. Appreciate it, buddy. No problem, no problem. So you have a very remarkable story. You grew up in uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Is that correct? That's correct. Small town Iowa boy right here. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. How was your upbringing in your childhood? Yeah, I mean, small town Iowa, I think people have a certain perception of what Iowa is, and it is exactly that if you're not from there. It's cornfields and not a lot to do. It's all about, you know, but for me, it's like coming from there, it's all about family and church and, you know, uh, character. And, you know, I was, a, I was a wrestler and a football player and then found out I could sing at a very young age. So <laughs> I, sang, I, sang, I think I sang for my girlfriend in a bedroom one time, and that was it. <laughs> I quit all. I love it. Yeah, it, small Midwest USA, a lot of deep rooted knitted families. I like that. Yeah. So it's a, and it seems like just hearing your story kind of seems like that. That's what you're about too, and uh, it's a good stand up dude. So uh, you just kind of alluded to it. You're a talented musician. Can you talk to me a little bit about? You said you sang for your girlfriend for the first time. <laughs> When was it for you of you're like, man, I'm pretty good at this. Like, I, I, I might be able to have something in this. Yeah, so very long story short, my dad owned a restaurant uh, called Joe's Country Grill because his name is Joe. So it was like a little country cafe. So at a very young age, I kind of came up in the restaurant. My mom was actually a waitress for my dad and worked for him. So they'd go there at like four in the morning and not come home till nine o'clock at night. So a lot of days where I'd sit at the counter and old guys would come in and, you know, tell me jokes and grew me up pretty fast. But a couple... Uh, would come in quite often and they would, I guess, witness to my parents where they would invite them to come to church. And my parents kind of had a, um, I guess, a not so great experience with church growing up. So they kind of always related church to that. So eventually this couple was so kind, um, started working on me, asked my parents if they could invite me to Sunday school. So um, this couple, Ron and Lila Fouts from Waterloo, Iowa, started taking me to their Baptist church every Sunday. So they'd pick me up. They had like a little van, pick up a bunch of kids and take them to church every Sunday. And we had to sit in the front row of this Baptist church every morning. And I think eight or nine, um, we sang out of hymnals back then. Eight or nine, I was just singing at the top of my lungs. And Ron looked down at me and he said, Jay, you can sing, buddy. I'm going to put you up in front of everyone next Sunday and make you sing for everyone which he did and uh, terrified out of my mind, but I'm glad I did it. Cause that was the first time, you know, everyone in the church, whether I was good or bad, they stood up and applauded and it was such a good feeling as a little kid. So that was the first time I thought, well, maybe I'm good at this, you know? And so I actually continued to sing in church um, all through my childhood, ended up becoming a worship leader, which I think is pretty typical in, in the Midwest. If you can sing, you end up singing in the church. For me, I ended up making a, you know, it became my career. Um, I went to school for it and got an internship at Orchard Hill Church in Cedar Falls, Iowa. That led to me moving down to Savannah, Georgia. I was a worship leader at a mega church. And um, the story goes on and on after that. Eventually made my way to Nashville and been here for about 10 years. So that is the very short version of it. <laughs> so you really growing up in the church, that's where you were like, all right, this is because you were performing essentially right in front of the choir. You were in the church choir and you were in front of the congregation, I'm assuming. Yeah, I was like helping like develop like volunteer worship bands and things like that. I started um, ministries at the University of Northern Iowa, which is still happening today. They pack out they pack out one of the facilities every Thursday night with all these college kids. So and then I helped start a uh, in church implant in um, Gurney Center, Iowa. All as a very young kid, so that was it. Was not only like um, giving, building me confidence and performing in front of people. It's hard to say performing when you when you're singing in the church because it's really a selfless act to lead worship. But it taught me how to gain, you know, have confidence being in front of people. More so, it taught me how to be a leader and taught me about the power of music. You know how to utilize music to bring healing and community through others, and that's really become my mission and my my ministry more than an artistry. Um, you know, with the story with losing my mom and writing a song about it and all the good that's come from it. And now I'm very proud to say we've helped raise $50 million to help fight against Alzheimer's because of it. So I accredit that to coming up in the church and singing in the church and realizing that you can bring so much good through music. I love it. I love it. 
let's transition into this because you just kind of alluded to it. Present day, you're in Nashville, Tennessee. You auditioned for The Voice. That's pretty cool. That must have been a cool, cool call um, or email, however they do it nowadays. You know, Zoom, they, Zoom. you never know how they do it nowadays. Um, so for you, you uh, you auditioned by singing Till You Can't uh, I, in the blind audition by Cody Johnson, right? Is that That's the song that you chose? Right. I, so I started having conversations with The Voice back in November. And really, you know, the decision for me to go on the show was... No, my hope was I feel like I've taken the storyline in my fight against Alzheimer's as far as I could on my own organically. So I thought, man, what what better way to put a lot of eyes and ears on this and help do even more good in the world if I go on this show? And uh, from what I've seen in the past, it's such a it's a positive show. You know, they're they're raising these artists up and helping them, you know, um, achieve their dreams and their goals. So, man, I thought what a great place to put more eyes and ears on this so that's why you know decided to do it and then choosing the song till you can't was pretty easy for me if you watch john legend asked me why did you choose that song yeah kind of funny to me because i felt like the song cho chose me i actually know the songwriters that wrote that song that song went number one this last year i called ben stennis one of the songwriters actually on my way out to la in confidence <laughs> let him know that i was singing his song and the dude immediately started tearing up. I could hear him tearing up over the phone. And he said, Jay, you don't know this, but we were thinking of you and your mom and your story when we were writing that song. He said that his dad um, got dementia. The other songwriter's mom got a rare form of a stroke and will never be the same again. So that's where the, the kind of the heart that that song came out of, which I obviously relate to. I was blown away that they had me in mind that they when they wrote it, especially since it went number one on country radio this last year. And so, like I said, the song really chose me and I relate to it because it's called Till You Can't. Uh, the songwriter, Ben Stennis, he said, you know, he has two daughters now, two little girls. And it's about, you know, like making the most out of life's moments and precious gifts and relationships. And so he says now on Sunday mornings, they wake up and he's like questioning, debating on whether to go to church or not. And his little girl will say, well, daddy, till you can't. You know, uh, and I, I relate to that so much. Obviously, with losing my mother, life is fleeting and so short. And um, so I, I was able to sing that song with pride and represent uh, my friends well, I thought. And then it alluded to it kind of transpired into me being, being able to talk about my story and losing my mom and all the good that's come from Blank Stairs. And then they asked me to sing Blank Stairs on the show, which I, I was blown away by. So I immediately was like, yep, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, that and that and blank stairs. That's the song that you said uh, you raised fifty million or some, uh, maybe a little more at this point uh, for your mother. As we're going into that, I know that that could be a, a touchy subject. Obviously, losing a loved one is never easy in any way, shape, or form. Even if you're preparing for it, it doesn't. You know, I, I always say there's no sequence of words to ever make it better. Never. So for you you obviously had a strong bond with your mom because I think one of the things you had mentioned while they were building you up was you always would, you would always sing country radio with your mom and, 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 and that you, well, one time you went and you did a performance with her in Nashville or, so, or you took her to see a performance in Nashville. And despite the fact that she couldn't comprehend, she was still being moved by music. So your mom, let's talk a little bit about that, if that's okay with you, just your relationship with her. I know everyone loves their moms, or, or they should, but for you, you clearly have a deep-rooted love for your mom, where she's almost now guiding you and inspiring you and your guardian angel on your journey of, the, of your music career. Would you say that's safe? Yeah, for me, you know, it's the saddest thing I think I'll ever experience in my life, I hope, but I'm very proud that we've turned it into something really beautiful. You know, my mom was, whether you had a what, what we consider to be a good mom or not, a present mom or not. I think everyone has kind of a picture of what a great mom is. My mother was exactly that. She was selfless and kind and shy. And, what, you know, I remember being young and I asked her, you know, mom, what, you know, what do you think your purpose is? Why do you think God put you on planet Earth? And without it, without a, he you know, without even hesitating, she said, Jay, God put me here to be your mom to love you and take care of you. And she truly believed that and truly raised me like that. I was not only the center of her universe, she raised me to believe that I was the center of the universe. I was a cocky little kid, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, I'll never forget the phone call I got from my dad. I grew up in a little town, Iowa. I moved to Nashville close to 10 years ago now. So I've been in Nashville for a couple of years when my dad called me. 
And he said, um, Jay, I feel like it's my obligation to let you know that your mother called me this morning. She's been going to the same place of work for years and years and years. She called because she had pulled over on the side of the road crying and she had no idea where she was and she needed me to come pick her up. And I was like, what? What is that? I mean, I was so uneducated. I had no idea what Alzheimer's was. So she was officially diagnosed at age 51 with what's called early onset Alzheimer's. They call it early onset because she was so young. It ended up taking her life in two years and nine months. So it progressed very quickly, which is very rare. The next phone call, I'll never forget, he said, again, I feel like it's my obligation as your dad to make sure that you get more time with your mom before this progresses any farther. So he brought her he uh, brought her to Nashville. That's about a 10 and a half hour drive from Cedar Falls, Iowa. And every two hours he would call me and he would say, Jay, prepare your heart. This is gonna be the hardest thing you've ever had to experience. And I can tell you what, I'm her oldest child, her only son. You cannot prepare yourself for your own mother to walk in the door of your home and look at you and not just look at you, but look through you. She looked at me like I was no one, like I was a stranger, looked through me. And uh, and not only it not only just like crushed me and broke my heart in the, in the moment, it, it made me mad. I'm usually, you know, there's fight or flight. I'm usually fight. In that moment, I was flight, man. I was like, let's get out of here. Let's go dancing and drinking, whatever we have to do. I cannot face this moment. It was very overwhelming. So we did, we took her out to a well-known venue here in Nashville called The Sutler. And, uh, you know, I talk about the power of music all the time now, and I, I'd heard about it back then, but I never experienced it until this moment. People that have dementia and Alzheimer's are not present. They seem lost and confused. They have a glossy blank look in their eyes. And, uh, you know, when we opened up the door of that bar, she saw a band and she heard the music and all that went away. She came back and she was, you know, she wanted to go inside and dance and she was trying to talk to me. So. I took her by the hand, I pulled her to the front of the venue right in front of the stage, and we started slow dancing to a fast song. And uh, just me and my mom in front of everyone out on the dance floor. And I think the band caught on because they slowed they slowed the music down a little bit. And I felt her take this, she like pulled me in, I felt her take a deep breath, and she just whispered in my ear, Jay, I've missed you so much. I love you, son. And I was like, <laughs> I got my mama back, you know. Um, and, you know, coming from how she raised me, you know, what I know, you know, this, who my mother is to suddenly feeling like I don't have her anymore to suddenly, oh my gosh, there's something, there's a tool out there that we can use to bring her back even for a moment's time. And it was music. And so they stayed with us for a couple of weeks here in Nashville and I did everything in my power to get her back and have those moments again and saw her a few times. And the day they left to go back to Iowa, I'm standing in my kitchen in Nashville. I am very lucky and blessed that I get to make music for a living. Uh, but I got to work really hard at writing songs. I'm not like my fiance, Kylie Morgan. She's signed to EMI. She'll wake up in the middle of the night, write a whole song. I got to work really hard at it. Um, but that day I just, I, I felt this just like overwhelming sense that I had this whole chorus and I had this hook and it was, uh, it was, I still see you mom in between the blank stairs. I still see you in between the blank stairs. I'm going to fight for you. And it was like this, uh, like this, like this mantra, and I just knew it was going to be so big and so powerful. Wrote it with a good buddy of mine um, on Music Row at Sony. We turned in the song to our publishers. In a few days, I get a phone call from the president of Sony, and he said, Jay, you don't know this, but I'm listening to your song, Blank Stairs. I know exactly what it's about because I lost my dad to Alzheimer's. I took care of him for the last five years of his life before he passed. He said, do me a favor said, I'm gonna get this in front of some very important people. You, you gotta promise me that every dime we make from this song, we give back towards the fight against Alzheimer's. So I said, yes, sir. In a very short period of time, it was being played on Sirius XM on the highway. And I started getting phone calls from the National Alzheimer's Association. I played my first ever gala. Back then I called it gala, but I've been corrected. <laughs> it's called gala. So uh, I'm standing in the back of this room in San Jose, California, and Brad Paisley's wife, Kim Paisley, gets on stage, the famous actress and introduces me and my band to come on stage. And I was like, what the heck? So I get up there, gin and tonic in hand. I'm wearing a t-shirt and ripped up jeans and everyone else is in like tuxedos and cocktail dresses. And I, I look down and Garth Brooks is right in front of me. I'm like, what the, where am I? <laughs> so I'm just a normal dude. So I told the story and sang the song through tears and man, the coolest thing happened. Um, 
And that moment, once I was done singing that song, I wipe my eyes and I look up and everyone in the room is standing. Some of the most famous, successful people in the world. And it didn't matter how much money they had, who they were. We all had a common ground in that moment that we had lost someone or were currently losing someone to this disease. And we all hugged and cried. And Garth Brooks came on stage and hugged me and said he's praying for my mom. And that night we raised a couple million bucks to help fight against Alzheimer's. And that was a very, you know, abrupt beginning to what ended up being, you know, now a couple years later, over $50 million to fight against Alzheimer's. We actually had to do a fact check. I found out it's closer to $100 million that this song was helped raise, which blew me away. I kind of keep my head down and keep playing every single event I can. So it's hard to keep track, but I'm, I'm so proud of it. And I do, I feel her, I feel her with me. You know, producers asked me on the voice for the blind audition, you know, like, do you think you'll see her in the, you know, out in the crowd. And like, I know I will, you know, I felt her overwhelming presence and was oddly so calm that day. And I'm, I couldn't be more proud of how it turned out and how the voice showcased my story. So very happy. And they did, they did, they did a great job of doing so. Cause I mean, even I, I was like, I, I got to get this guy on the show. It was amazing. It was very touching, obviously, even hearing you sing the lyrics and even I think Gwen Stefani was crying. Camila Cabello was like, Oh my goodness, that was a beautiful lyric. So you can definitely, it resonates within even just the audience. So I think they did a great job. And I think you did a great job at writing the song because it was really from your heart and, and the love of your mother, which I, which is remarkable. And thank you for sharing that story. Cause that's such a outer being experience of you seeing some celebrities, some people you look up to, and all of a sudden you're now sharing in a moment with them. And it, it's beautiful. So I'm so glad because I think that that's something that you needed for yourself as well to truly live it and to feel it. So um, thank you, my friend. So Blake and Gwen turn around for you during your blind audition. Uh, Blake called you a UFC fighter. and yeah. <laughs> uh, But you ended up choosing Gwen Stefani. Are you, are you able to say anything within yourself as to why you made that decision? Yeah, going into it, I actually hoped that she'd be the one to turn around. I, I kind of had already predetermined that I was going to go with Miss Gwen uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, my soon-to-be wife, Kylie Morgan, told me I had to choose Gwen. <laughs> She's been a huge Gwen fan since she was little. Number two, um, I mean, I'm surrounded by strong, beautiful, powerful women, and they inspire me daily, Kylie being one of them, the way that my mom raised me. I have people that, you know, women that have stepped into my life and taken, like, a motherly role that are very strong, beautiful, successful women. And I, I've just learned so much from them. And seeing Gwen, age 53, still absolutely physically gorgeous, but she's maintained, she's paved just a way for herself and, you know, retained so much success over such a long period of time. I'm just like, gosh, there's so much to learn from a woman like that. So that's why I chose her. When, when Blake turned around and it was like a little fight between them, I was a little conflicted, <laughs> but I'm, I, I'm glad that I stick to my guns. I'm kind of, I take pride in going against the grain. I'm always that guy. So I'm, I'm so glad that I chose her. I, I, I thought for sure you were going to choose Blake. Cause you said, uh, Oh, I see myself as a mix between Blake Shelton, uh, meeting, uh, you know, Chris Daughtry. I think you said Daughtry. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I for sure was a little, I was like, Whoa, I, Oh, he's definitely going to, but then when you uh, you said Gwen, but uh, happy wife, happy life, uh, your, your, your future wife was pulling the strings of kind of. Say, but you're not wrong about the longevity as well. And also just um, the um, how do I say the vast variety of Gwen's talent, because she's more than just Holla Batgirl. And I think obviously that's that's her more popular, um, you know, track. But even as she was talking to you about it, she's like, oh, I, I have been singing country songs as well. So just the talent is very, there's a vast area that she is very talented in. And as you said, so I think that that was, uh, you know, good for you. I think you, obviously there was a lot more behind it, but even just your own sake. You mentioned your wife, uh, your future wife. Uh, your wedding is going to be soon, right? At like four or five days. Is that correct? Yeah, so our wedding is supposed to be uh, October 1st on Saturday, but Hurricane Ian is storming that way. We're supposed to get married on Fort Myers Beach, so we're kind of taking it almost hour by hour, and there's a lot of pieces and parts and, you know, a lot of people involved and a lot of money involved, so 
we're just praying first and foremost that everyone's just we have so many people down there that we love and care about and all their homes and businesses so we're asking for prayers for them first and foremost our wedding can get moved at the end of the day we can do it another time so um but yeah prayers are appreciated it's been a year and a half of a lot of hard work to make it happen so we shall see what god has in store for us within the next few days I love that. That's beautiful because I think I saw you say uh, something on your Instagram post. You said, or your story, you said, I can get married any other Saturday, right? Like at the end of the day, it's, it, and I think that that just shows who you two are as a couple because you two are just very selfless and understanding that there's there's a bigger picture. And I think that, that uh, a lot of that is obviously contributed to your faith, but also just the individuals that you two are. So um, kudos to both of you. Where can people find you to listen to your work, see all that you do? I know I just mentioned your Instagram. You can throw out your Instagram name, whatever whatever it is that uh, you feel like people can kind of reach out and and even just donate to uh, uh, to because I, I was trying to look. I couldn't find where to donate um, to that song. So where can people find you? Yeah, uh, the money that we've raised kind of has been spread out all over. First and foremost, we, you know. I partner with the National Alzheimer's Association and I do so much work with them. So you can just go to alz.org and you can donate directly towards them. I kind of, I, I take a lot of pride in kind of being the face and a, a new voice, pun intended, uh, <laughs> for, for the Alzheimer's community. A really big place. This, you know, uh, someone had taken a video of me um, performing blank stairs with my mom in my arms on stage um in iowa we i think we're opening for you know one time we did open up for chris lane and then jake on another time but that video that that guy took he posted on his facebook page and i know a lot of younger people you know they aren't really on facebook anymore but our community you know i didn't really understand social media uh up until this story happened but that guy posted that video on his facebook he got 500 million views it like turned into a bunch of viral videos that's kind of where everything exploded and we we're on ABC, World Nightly News, People TV because of it. Um, so I, I didn't really understand the purpose of social media until that happened. And then I literally saw my Facebook page explode and become a place of community for people. There are people I've met in the comments of my posts and uh, made friends, uh, got in contact and put on Alzheimer's events and fundraisers and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. So. Um, Facebook is, is, is a great place if you want to go. That's kind of where the whole storyline started. Um, but everything for me on social media is J Allen Music if you want to find me on there. Awesome. The visual audience will see it. The audio audience will not. You are decked out with tattoos. Can you, <laughs> can you enlighten any of Can you, like, what, what, are, what are some of the works you got on that? Can you, like, uh, explain when you got them? They're pretty cool. Yeah, so I actually wrote a song to explain myself uh, called Tattoos to Heaven. Um, and I released that a couple years ago. Um, a long time ago, I decided, I, you know, I wanted to get tattoos, but do with purpose because I just I wanted to wake up every morning. It's so hard, I think, to get um, to beat yourself up. But if you, you know, we're always driving forward, looking through a windshield. This is kind of like my visual how I explain it. We're driving forward through life, looking through a windshield. Sometimes we forget to stop and look through the rearview mirror and be reminded of what God brought us to to make us who we are. So that's what my tattoos are. They're a, they're a rear view mirror. Um, every piece is a, as a story, something I went through good and bad, you know, I have, I have an angel on my arm for my mom. I have a, uh, an elephant because that's a symbol for the national, the, the national Alzheimer's association. Um, I covered up my ex-wife's name. <laughs> I have my new soon to be wife on my arm. I call her my mermaid. She saved, literally saved my life. Uh, stallion on my arm. Cause they're my best friends who have my back. Um, a wolf on my back, the, the saying, throw me to the wolves, I'll come back leading the pack. That's kind of my mantra for my life. So I have 110 hours with the ink on my body. And I get to wake up every morning, look in the mirror and be reminded of all those things. And uh, it kind of just like pumps me up every day. It gives me motivation to go one more day. Um, so I actually wrote a song about it. Like I mentioned, Tattoos to Heaven. And, uh, I, you know, every morning I try to get in the gym and Everyone, you know, has their time of prayer if you have faith. And for me, it's that time. So I remember, you know, just talking to God and saying, man, just let the song touch one person, influence one person, move one person, connect to one person. So we dropped that song. I get an email from my manager and it was a forwarded email uh, the next day. And it went like this. It said, Jay, you don't know me, but my name is Don Kasky. 
I'm from Toledo, Ohio. I have stage four terminal kidney cancer. He said, I just heard your song, Tattoos to Heaven. I want to share my story. He said, when I found out that I'm going to die soon from this, I decided instead of beating myself up and being all sad that I was going to try to leave a mark on the world. So he started getting matching tattoos with strangers all around the world. Uh, that time, I think he was like 300 and some matching tattoos. So he asked if he'd get a matching tattoo with me. I said, yes, sir. So we brought him to Nashville. The very first time me and Don Kasky met, we got matching tattoos. And so we're done. And uh, after the session, he goes, well, what are you doing tomorrow? And I was like, I think you got to go home. <laughs> but no, I was like, actually, we were playing a show in Peoria, Illinois, a full band show at a theater. And I said, actually, I think it'd be cool if you come on stage with me and that uh, we'll show off our tattoos and I'll tell your story. I think it'd be a good time to kind of minister to people. So we get to that part of the set. He comes on stage. I pull my shirt to the side and show off the tattoo. Don Caskey takes off his whole shirt on stage in a nice theater and kept his shirt off the whole time and like did a Facebook Live. It was so funny. Uh, but I'm really proud of that because that prayer was answered. One person was touched and people.com covered the story and the song. And, and so and it helped explain even more so why I decided to get covered in ink. So uh, and I found that a lot of people have a hard time explaining why they have tattoos. So when I do, it helps them. It's, a, it's another cool way that music has touched people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like you said, everyone has a meaning to you. So I, I like how you're able to pinpoint every single one. And you're like, oh, that means that that means that I I love. And most people who have sleeves and a lot of art, they, they really can't do that. But you're able to pinpoint every single one. So, well, but thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time being a guest. I wish you and your future wife nothing but love, memories and beautiful experiences. I hope you keep kick butt this upcoming season um I, i'll definitely be pulling for you and watching and obviously supporting your fight against alzheimer's and and so and being that you know that centerpiece of representing uh the fight against it so thank you jay allen i really appreciate you so much what a pleasure thank you nathaniel no problem no problem so please do not forget to click the subscribe button so you can stay up to date listen to cool stories like this uh jay is a great dude i appreciate him doing this i normally sign off every episode by saying may you live may you love and may you thrive i genuinely mean that for you jay i appreciate you so much my friend thank you brother your family now buddy keep in touch we'll do we'll do thank you so much my friend all right thank you for tuning to another episode of the raise reflection podcast take care everyone